If we go back to earlier forms of personality dimensions, uh, Eisnick really identified these two dimensions of neuroticism and extroversion. Uh, in some sense, these might be thought of as kind of more basic, stronger factors. It's not entirely clear. And this extroversion thing keeps coming up over and over again. And another way of thinking about it is in the context of approach versus avoid. Uh, this is another dimension, you know, aligned with that extroversion dimension, but it, it goes beyond just pure social interaction and is more like generic approach behavior. Do you want, are you enthusiastic? Are you going forward? Are you seeking out? Uh, again, it, it also ties into openness to some extent um, versus kind of avoidance-like behavior, uh, uh, being very shy, trying to avoid social interactions in the social dimension, but also kind of more anxious uh, in, in the neuroticism dimension. So these things kind of can be rotated in different ways and, and, and understood in, as along these different dimensions. Um, the approach versus avoid has been associated very strongly with core animal brain system level organization. Uh, and this is also known as the behavioral activation system in the approach system and the behavioral inhibition system in the avoid dimensions. And so, you know, if you have an overall bias or predilection uh, towards approach behavior versus avoidance behavior, that may be uh, a way of understanding different aspects of the overall personality dimensions. And then how that plays out in the context of social versus intellectual uh, factors may uh, explain whether it shows up in a kind of extroversion dimension versus an openness dimension. So things can kind of uh, uh, be organized in different ways, and we can understand different underlying neural systems uh, in terms of these uh, underlying approach versus avoid dynamics. Interesting features of the big five personality dimensions. One is that uh, it seems like there's a difference in overall social desirability for different of these facets. Uh, there seem to be a good versus a bad side in general to each of these different dimensions. So if we go back and look at these, I guess openness is debatable. As somebody who's higher in, in overall openness, I, I tend to think of the more kind of curious aspect and open, uh, you know, intellectually open kind of aspect as being more positive. Um, and, you know, clearly being more conscientious, being more responsible seems like a good thing as opposed to being an irresponsible layabout. In general, we have a higher uh, esteem for people who are extroverts and can interact with people socially. And again, this popularity dominance kind of dimension is, is, is how we sort people in a lot of ways. Uh, agreeableness, being high in agreeableness seems better, like we want people who are pro-social and warm. And then maybe low in neuroticism uh, is, is generally considered to be more positive. Um, so how does that, uh, the fact that we have these different sides of these uh, dimensions that people actually genuinely do uh, rate themselves, and it's very interesting, people will be honest in, in expressing, uh, you know, these quote unquote socially less desirable negative aspects of their personality. Um, that's one of the important uh, things you need to look for in designing these personality inventories to test and, and accurately see people's uh, full expression. But I think you can also see that if you do have these personality dimensions that shapes your value system and you actually may think that they're good, right? And so if you're if you're really antisocial, you actually think, well, all these people are a bunch of fools and I don't really want to, you know, be affiliating with them. So it sort of reinforces that uh, sense of of what's important. And so everybody who, who kind of is in these different dimensions, even though there may be a kind of more global sense of what's the what's a so, socially positive thing, uh, individual people will, will have different sense of values depending on their own personality variables. And it also turns out that people uh, can make very valuable contributions to society by having these dimensions of variability. And so one kind of uh, evolutionary argument may be that, in fact, uh, we have all these kind of variability. Everybody's so different because uh, that really helps society as a whole. And if everybody was all really pro-social and happy, then, you know, we wouldn't necessarily make the hard decisions uh, that we need, making sacrifices and, and uh, 
Uh, we need mean people to get us to do the hard things that uh, we otherwise wouldn't uh, be able to do if we were all super nice. And as, as we've emphasized throughout a lot of these personality variables, you can see really reflect the importance of social interaction in our lives. As I mentioned, about 50% of the variance in, in uh, people's uh, personality is uh, estimated to be attributable to genetic heritability. You can actually really see this, uh, not that your kids will be necessarily the same as you, but you can see from very early on that, that kids have this kind of temperament, this early aspect of personality and it, you know, it evolves as, as they grow and develop, but you can really see strong differences once you have your second kid. You can really see, oh, wow, that kid is, seems really different than the first kid. Um, and so you really get a sense of how these genetic factors, uh, these early uh, fixed kind of biological factors play a really strong role in guiding uh, kind of people's behavior. Traits do tend to get more stable over time. Uh, and the biggest change in personality variables really comes about in adolescence, this period of great upheaval in your, your individual uh, overall uh, personality and, and identity and everything is all kind of being established at the same time. So there's different ways of measuring stability over time. One is rank order stability. So which factors are the strongest over time? Those tend to be more stable. So if you are a highly neurotic person early on, then you're pro that's probably gonna still be your biggest factor, even though if your absolute levels of it may change, it still ends up being kind of the biggest factor, relatively speaking. Um, and then there's also this kind of overall uh, population level of, of trait, um, the mean level, and that's less stable over time. We can also think about gender differences. In general, women tend to be higher in neuroticism, extroversion, agreeableness, and conscientiousness relative to men. So you get, uh, and that kind of fits with some of our general stereotypes about gender differences. Um, and again, these do show up statistically in these kinds of personality tests. And finally, we can think about the, the actual techniques that are used to measure these personality variables. The most widely used one is something called the NEO-PI, the New Personality Inventory. Uh, it asks pretty straightforward questions that directly relate to the dimensions of interest. So it has high face validity. The questions sort of make sense in terms of what, what, what these underlying constructs are. Um, it's useful mainly for kind of normal people in the normal range of, of personality variables. There's this other kind of very strange thing called the MMPI, uh, which is uh, kind of more objective. It can be scored by a computer. It doesn't, the questions are very strange, but statistically they, they seem to uh, correlate with these underlying personality variables. Um, and uh, it, it's more often used for abnormal diagnosis. And then there's these earlier things, especially like you might've heard about the Rorschach test. You look at an ink blot, and you kind of say, what, is that, what does that remind you of? What do you think that is? And, and have that as a way of kind of figuring out your own personality. These are low in, in validity and in reliability and are not at all widely used in, the day, in modern scientific work. So really the main, the main instrument that people use these days is the NEO-PI. And that's really the, the mechanism that, that was developed and kind of shaped by the big five personality factor variables. We can look at different uh, brain areas associated with people who are high versus low in these different personality dimensions. Some of this makes sense. Again, conscientiousness being kind of a prefrontal uh, dimension of uh, how much uh, top-down cognitive control can you exert. That makes sense. Extroversion being this kind of more uh, medial, emotional kind of area. It kind of makes sense. Agreeableness, superior temporal locus and retrospinal cortex. Mm, that's interesting, but yeah, I'm not sure I would have predicted that. Um, so it isn't really clear how much of a kind of literal, you know, brain system mapping there is, but maybe there's some interesting findings. Finally, the most popular uh, in the in the popular press and popular, you know, what kids talk about when they talk about personality tests is this Myers-Briggs personality inventory. It's available for free online and it's fun to kind of categorize yourself. 
Um, it has overall low uh, reliability uh, compared to the Neo PI, but otherwise it does actually tell us more or less about the same factors. So you can actually see these kind of different dimensions, E, I, extroverted, introverted. So that's really the same thing is getting at this extroversion dimension from the knee, from the big five. Uh, sensing versus knowing, uh, openness, uh, thinking versus feeling is agreeableness, judging versus perceiving is kind of conscientiousness. They're not a perfect mapping and it's, it's not really, there's nothing in there relating to neuroticism. So it's, it's really just kind of like a bad version <laughs> of a uh, more reliable test like the Neo PI. And so people who actually do research in this area are just like, don't take that test. It's just kind of, you know, it's, it's only a bad version of a much better thing that you could actually take.